We're celebrating Mother's Day at Context and we're taking an in-depth look at the Supermom. There is no greater job in the world than to raise children. I only had the chance to do that for two, the most rewarding task I've ever undertaken. There's a lot of pressure on mother. Today we unpack how to make the job great and we begin with author and mum to five, Dr. Daisy Sutherland. Okay, your book, Letting Go of Supermom, brings into focus the cautions one should have with that ideal. Why did you write this book? I, wa I wanted to write the book because I was guilty of trying to lead or be a mom that was a super mom, being, having five children and doing so many things. My platter was overflowing because I didn't know how to say no. And then when I came online, I realized that a lot of women were trying to emulate me. And I saw them going crazy and always asking me, how do you do it all? How do you do it all? And it finally, under I understood that if I was to be a role model to these other women, to these other moms, that I had to let go of that title of super mom and truly understand that to live a happy, balanced life, you don't have to constantly say yes. And so it just wasn't healthy. And so I had to let go of that extreme title and let women know that it's okay that you don't have to be a super mom. Your book offers tips for helping moms find balance in life, including parenting and relationship tools, time management, keys to handling stress, so much more. Give our viewers some tools. Let's start with parenting and relationships. When it comes to parenting, it depends on if they're both, if you have both parents in the home or if you just have the one parent in the home because nowadays you just don't know. So if you have both parents in the home, then they should work as a team, equal, seriously. And the children need to see that. And not pinning one against the other, not being better than the other, that type of thing, that when you're in the home, it should be a team. I, I think that that old saying where the community needs to be involved in rearing the child, I still think that that should be part of it. And that falls into play when it comes with a single mom as well. Not to feel that she's ever alone, that it's okay to ask for help and to accept help. And that's one of the th things as a super mom that you have to let go of thinking that you have to do it all, that it's okay to accept help. That doesn't mean that you're weak. Whether you're a single parent or a parent with, you know, your spouse in the home, allow help. That is the biggest thing. Well, what about the big one, time management? Okay, so time management is huge. Don't think that you have to do everything on your list, right, in one day. I always tell whether it's in handling a home, well, your home is like a business. I always think of it as a business, right? How would you handle your business? Then do the same thing at home, and it'll work a lot better and everyone will be working in harmony, or you would hope. So I would um, strive to do two or three things on your list, and then don't beat yourself up if you don't get it accomplished. So Dr. Sutherland, how do you bring balance to your busy life? You're a CEO, an author, an international speaker, and you've got five kids. Ah, I stick them all in the closet. No, seriously though. Um, let's see, well, I'm a mom of five. A lot of them have grown. So I'm, I'm left with two. I've homeschooled them all. So that's not even part of my bio. I've homeschooled all my children and my husband and I run a chiropractic business together. The best thing that we've done, let's see, take the veil off. I have taught my children to help each other out because it's a team in our home. I am not the one who's responsible to do everything. So when we walk into our home, our, everyone is doing their part. I learned to early on to close the door of their bedrooms because I would definitely lose my mind because their room is a hot mess. So I've learned to close the door and not stress myself out over that. I give them fair warning though, so that uh, they get three warnings. And after the third warning, if I can't see their floor, then I go in with a black garbage bag and pick up everything off the floor. And I don't care what it is. It could be electronic, shoes, whatever. And they lose it until their room is clean. And then they may get it back or they may not. But I've learned also to take some time for myself. It's real important. 
as the mom that you need to take care of you in order to be able to take care of everyone else. It's impossible to take care of everyone and neglect yourself. And I always fall back on that analogy of the airplane. When you're in the airplane and the pressure drops and the oxygen mask comes off, what does the flight attendant tell you to do? You place it on yourself first before you place it on your children. Why? Because if you place it on your children, who's going to take care of them if you fainted? So you need to take care of yourself first. And it's not being selfish. It's a necessity. In order for you to take care of your family, you need to have the energy and you need to be healthy and you need to be happy to, in order to be able to take care of everyone else. And how does your relationship with Christ inform the type of mom you want to be? Let me tell you, Christ comes first in our house and they know it. And it's because of that that it's given me the balance. My faith is much stronger. When I allowed myself to let go and let God truly, is when everything um, fell into place, truly. You can't do it on your own. It's impossible. He's there. He's the ultimate parent. God is the ultimate parent. And he's waiting for you to ask him questions. Not constantly just go to him when you need help. Because I tell women that as well. How would it be if your child always came to you, Mom, I need help with this. Mom, I broke this. Mom, can you do this? Mom, purchase this. But, you know, all this time. Well, that's what it feels like when we're going to God, always asking, going, turning to him when we're in trouble, turning to him when we're in pain, turning to him when we just need something. It's wearing on a mom. You, can you imagine how wearing it is on our ultimate father? So learning to just have conversations with him and just, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, thank you for this beautiful day. Being grateful all the time, constantly. Good and bad. Always being thankful and grateful because everything happens for a reason. And it took a long time for me to understand that. Dr. Daisy Sutherland, author of Letting Go of Supermom, Dr. Mommy's Get Real Approach to a Balanced Life. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Some of the most pressured moms are Canada's Indigenous women. And to help us understand their approach to motherhood challenges, we're joined by Professor Sherry Rosette. Sherry, what comes to mind when you think of the term super mom? Well, I think women entering the workforce, um, although women have always worked very hard, when I think of a definition of a super mom, who comes to mind for me is not, say, the conventional definitions of a super mom, but this summer I was taken by um, a friend of mine who's the grandson and his uncle, who is the son of a Métis woman who raised 20 children on the road allowance in Saskatchewan in a very small house. For me, that's a super mom. So this is a mom who raised 20 kids uh, with pretty modest resources, um, but did, you know, created this really big loving family. So sometimes our definitions of mothering and who's the super mom is really, uh, I think, comes from a history of women with minimal resources who faced a lot of challenges, but were still able to create a circle of family with her children under difficult circumstances. I think that's our lineage of super moms. So give us a sense of how the super mom is approached by our indigenous mothers. When we think of super moms, people generally talk about our grandmothers. And we think of the challenges that a lot of those women faced. Um, one of the things that I, I just taught today, I, I just taught about the women at Batoche in 1885 and how those women had their homes burnt down and lost everything that they had. And then basically picked up and got on with things. Thought about how am I going to clothe my kids? How am I going to feed my kids? And just carried on, survived, and that's the reason our communities are here today. So to me, those are, like, to me, that's our legacy of super Um, the women who rose through, like, really extraordinary historical circumstances. I think for those of us um, who might fall into the more conventional super mom category, you know, you're looking at, I think the assumption is that this is an upwardly mobile career woman who is facing a lot of challenges in, you know, to move forward in her career and those kinds of demands, and then plus having the demands of 
being a mom. And, and that sometimes those mom expectations don't change much. And there's been studies about who does most of the housework and who's the kind of fallback parent. And I think it's changing, but I mean, there has been a definite tendency that those duties are seen as being moms. So when we're thinking about Indigenous women and Supermom, there is actually another layer to explore. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I think so. I think we've definitely had our Supermoms over the years. And I think added to the expectations on Aboriginal women, which kind of complicate the idea of a Supermom, is that Aboriginal women have, you know, lots of Aboriginal women are going to school. I think women make up um, really the majority of uh, Aboriginal students. A lot of those women are moms. So in addition to having a career, raising a family, I think the additional um, pressures, I says, but they're also joys, is the expectation that there will be an element of activism in your life, that you will be committed not only to your family, but to your community. And then the other thing is the, um, if you have the knowledge if you have cultural knowledge, then that there is, you have the responsibility for passing down c cultural knowledge if you can. So it's like a, it sort of complicates the notion of the super mom. So tell us what the spirit of Mother's Day looks like for Indigenous women. On Mother's Day, it's like everybody else. You, you think it's a time you're going to for sure give your mom a phone call. You kind of hope your kids phone you. Um, there's other, maybe other days that are more, I, mean, I guess in some ways every day is Mother's Day. Um, and there's times when we really, like, for example, this week we're having an elders gathering at the University of Manitoba. And women will be involved there and will be honoured there. So it's not connected to Mother's Day in any way. It's just that whenever people get together, you know, trying to honour those grandmothers as much as we can. Sherry Rosette, Professor of Native Studies, Women and Gender Studies at the University of Manitoba, thank you for joining us. Hey. Coming up, one year after taking her children around the world in order to expand their outlook, we check in on Dr. Rose Meter to see if her mothering is unfolding as What do you get when you bring together a doctor, a mother of three, and a world traveler? emergency room physician Rose Meter. Our journey with Rose and her family started over a year ago before they set off around the globe. Now back home, safe and sound, Sheldon caught up with Dr. Meter and her family. You balance being a, a mom of four, a wife, an emergency physician. You know, hearing this, some would look at you and all that you balance and say, there goes a super mom. Is that an accurate title to describe you? So if you ask me if I'm a super mom, I, I wish I had a sledgehammer to smash that term because it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't exist other than I think a vehicle for guilt. I, I don't like the term super mom. I mean, I'm doing my absolute best. I've lost one of them. I'm cheating. Come <laughs> here. Stand um, and, and every mom does, like with the best of their intentions, but it's, it's hard. It's probably the toughest job I've ever signed up for in my entire life. How does your relationship with Christ um, inform what it means to you to be a mom? Well, uh, two words would come to my mind, <laughs> self-sacrifice and unconditional love. I mean, there are things that I aspire to. Definitely, I've, I've known the unconditional love of Christ in my life. I've known his grace and his sacrifice for me. And as a mom, you aspire for your love to be like that for your kids, don't you? Um, and, and there's no particular roadmap to make that easy or achievable in my own strength ever. But, but it's definitely something I strive towards. And day by day, regular life lesson after regular life lesson, with every once in a while a glimmer of amazing reward that I may be doing, doing the right thing or a, a good job, but, um, but not in my own strength whatsoever. I definitely rely on God's grace um, and, and love for me. When you're looking back, talk to me about the lessons you've learned about being a mother with four young children on a trip 
around the world? I think the lessons are a little bit of uh, adaptation, adaptability, adaptability. The lessons involve some resilience, <laughs> some uh, doing without the comforts of home, and a little extra patience with myself and with each other. Um, and train schedules and flights and accommodations and plans that we made didn't always work out the way we intended to, but we did our best and we definitely bonded. It was the six of us, really, um, in this incredibly tight knit circle the entire time we were away. It was wonderful to come home and re experience the comforts of home, but uh, it was a test of resilience sometimes. At the end of this journey with your family around the world, I'm curious to know what qualities you feel define motherhood that you're passionate to not give up on. You know, I think a love for adventure and kind of being okay with unpredictability because even at times when I was stretched and it just the day wasn't working out exactly the way I intended, my kids were fine and I... I sometimes just needed to embrace that and know that, okay, supper's not going to happen the way we wanted it to tonight. We don't even have a fridge to put our leftovers in or a grocery store that I recognize to try and go um, to shop at. But, but then we were creative. And, um, and <coughs> some nights we knew where the ice cream store was. And so there was one night in Guatemala that we had ice cream for dinner. <laughs> And it was okay. And there were no fruits or vegetables uh, that, that meal, but I had to be okay with it. Um, you know, wanting the best for your kids. Every meal is nutritious and healthy, but it wasn't always. And, and so n not worse for wear, I don't think. We survived that and embraced the adventure of the next day. Dr. Rose Meter Zacharias, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having us. Well, now we head out to the Canadian prairies to hear from a mother whose life was shaped by deep tragedy. Shelley Boyce joins us in Estevan, Saskatchewan. Shelley, describe your early life as a mother. My early life as a mother began in the 1980s. It was wonderful. It was always my desire to be a mom. And in 1987, my first daughter was born. Um, in 89, my second daughter, and then in 93, we completed our family with our third daughter. And being a mom was one of the most precious things that I'd ever done in my entire life. Um, I loved being with my children. In fact, um, I gave up my teaching job to stay home with my children and raise them. And uh, we actually also homeschooled our children for a, a period of time. So I loved being with my children. I loved watching them grow and develop and, and they were involved in many activities as well. As a mom, your journey with your daughters helped inspire the launch of Choose Life Ministry. 2006 though, was a life altering year for you. What happened? 2006, my oldest daughter, Kylie, uh, had just completed her second year of university in Regina and she had gone back to uh, Bean Fate, Saskatchewan to work for the summer. And on May 20th of 2006, I got a phone call informing me that she had been killed in a car accident that night. In the aftermath of losing your oldest daughter, what was that experience like? At first you're in complete shock. You just it's just a matter of getting through each minute of each day. Uh, you're in survival mode. Uh, there were many days when I would just collapse on the floor in a heap and just sob. But I also had two younger daughters who were 16 and 13 at the time. And uh, I had to be a mom to them. I had to be strong for them as well. Um, and they really, really struggled with the death of their sister. Um, in addition to being sisters, they were also best friends. And so to lose a best friend at, at that critical time in their life when they were still developing and, and learning how to you know, get along in life, it was very difficult for them. Um, both of them turned to coping mechanisms 
mainly drugs and alcohol. And so that was very difficult for me as a mom to watch as well. So where did you go to find spiritual support to help you heal after the death of your oldest daughter? I actually started reaching out to people that I knew uh, had a relationship with God, were still walking with God. And um, in all of that, they encouraged me to just take it one step at a time, um, to lean on him, to rely on him. My sister had a big part in all of that as well. Well, talk to us about the journey to healing you went through with your girls. I just encouraged them and tried to um, surround them with other young people that also could help them in their walk with the Lord. Um, they also were very discouraged, very disappointed at that time, thinking, you know, um, how could God let something like this happen to our sister? It turns around with a change of mind. There was a time uh, in my life when I, and without even knowing it, uh, I was sitting having some quiet time with the Lord one morning, and I had a eureka moment. And the, the eureka moment was that I had been deceived into thinking that my children were a source of pain and hurt and disappointment because of the things that I had been through. And all of a sudden, the light came on, and it was like, no, that's not what God's Word says about children. It says in Psalm 127 that they are uh, a gift and a blessing. And as soon as I had that change of mind and started responding to my girls in that way, um, you're a gift, you're a blessing. It doesn't matter the circumstances. And started loving them in that manner, that's when things started to turn around. And it was actually a lack of support from organizations with your two younger daughters that has now led you to start your own faith-based program, Choose Life Ministry. Tell us about this journey. During the time that my girls were going through their struggles, I looked far and wide for a program that would help them, a Christian-based program where they could go and see some real transformation in their lives. And I was finding nothing. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, some, um, and but really in Canada, very few programs where they could go and receive help. Um, there were some secular programs that were 28-day type um, rehab centers, but um, they had been to one or two of those, and there was no lasting change. Um, they would change for a, for a bit, but then nothing uh, that was transforming. And so I decided that uh, Saskatchewan was the ideal place to plant a program like this. And I had been following uh, Mercy Ministries in the United States that was founded by Nancy Elkhorn. And I, my husband Shane and I actually went down to Nashville and we toured their headquarters and looked at the program and we were just so encouraged by the changes that were taking place in the lives of the women that were going through that program. And so we decided that we would start Choose Life Ministry in Saskatchewan and model it after Mercy Ministries um, so that we could help young women uh, ages 18 to 29 uh, see some transformation in their lives and things that were causing them to stumble and causing them to uh, get off track. Your program is faith-based, serving young women in Southeast Saskatchewan and beyond. How does God's healing and recovery for young women help something like this? Yeah, the, the Bible instructs us that we need to renew our minds, and it takes some time to renew our minds. And so we want to really plant the Word of God in these girls and, and just have the uh, experience of loving on them and showing them what it means uh, to have the love of Christ in their lives. And that's, that's a, an ongoing thing, but six months is a, a good period of time for them to experience that. What advice would you give mothers watching who are facing tragedy, loss, and are, are really looking for hope? Mm. Yeah, the, the best advice I can give comes also from the Word of God. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this was definitely an evil time in my life. Um, but through it all, even when I'd walked away from the Lord, he never let go of me. And there's a song by Matt Redman called You Never Let Go. Um, and it says, you know, 
through the calm and through the storm, you never let go. He was always there for me. Um, my trust and my faith in him is what got me through. And it's what gets me through every day still with my daughters and, and uh, you know, other people that, I, that God brings me in contact with that he calls me to love as well. Shelley Boyce, Executive Director of Choose Life Ministry, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next, my favorite advice for being a super mom after this. As we reflect on Mother's Day, my closing advice on the most important job in the world, the best thing a mother can do for her child, no matter its age, infant to adult, the best gift is a mother in a vibrant relationship with God. Mothering that finds relationship with God is the super mom. A God-inspired heart for mothering is filled with self-sacrifice, with humor, with hope, love, forgiveness, and imagination. As you reflect on Mother's Day, give yourself the supernatural gift of God. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thanks for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. We have more news for you online at Context. Now these are the stories you will not see on TV, but they are a daily delivery for your phone, iPad, or computer. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look. Recent news has shed light on what some are calling a suicide pandemic across Aboriginal communities in Canada. We spoke to researchers to learn a little bit more. Introducing our brand new digital show, Outside the Box. Join me every week as we explore how God interacts with the everyday moments in the lives of everyday people. Like worship leader Dana Marie, who moved all the way to Australia to study with Hillsong. Take a look. I couldn't really stray too far, but once I was kind of taken out of there and I had to figure out life by myself, you know, I got really lonely at times or I would be really nervous and scared about things and I had no other option but just to you know, pray and read my Bible and really just call on God. Do sports matter to God? Professor John Stackhouse says it does. Read his thoughts on the blog. Find all that and so much more, my friends, online at contextwithlorna.com.